Okay, we're slowly coming back here. Hello? There you are. Okay, I don't know what happened there, but uh, we'll get it in post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just we'll just cut that and edit them, edit them together. I'm like, I hear you mid sentence. I'm like, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't. I, I'm not even doing anything. I'm just like, what's yeah. Going all on? of a sudden, I was just talking to my screensaver. I was like, oh whoa, wait. Yeah. <laughs> like, like what happened? Like, that's my it's... desktop. Like, what's going on? All right. Sorry about it's that. It's all my fault because I was late. My bad. That's what it was. <laughs> I off the time. I will take ownership. <laughs> You know, I tell you. Uh, all right. Of all days. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What was the point you were trying to make? Um, yeah. the references. Oh, um, the references. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm real quick. Let me look this guy up so I can say his name. Sleeping Hollow Cast. Um. Uh, the, the heavy set character that gets killed uh, in the graveyard. Oh, what's his name? Oh, the magistrate. Oh, yeah. The magistrate. Yeah. The magistrate. Okay. Yeah, the magistrate. Um, Samuel. Was it Samuel? I thought it was Mark. Uh, well, his real name is uh, Richard Griffin, but he plays the magistrate. Phillips. Samuel. Phillips. Phillips. Magistrate Phillips. Okay, there we go. Yeah. yeah. So uh, his death scene in the graveyard um, was, I, I, I want to think, I would like to think that it was a reference um, to uh, one of the original, uh, what's this guy's name? Washington Irving was the uh, original creator original writer for the Sleepy Hollow. Um I don't even remember. Yeah, you're 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 going deep, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Yeah, well in 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 his in his story, um one of the versions um was that the uh horseman pretty much couldn't leave that area. Um so the, the okay. death scene in the, in the cemetery, um, I, I'd like to think that it was a reference to, you know, one of those origin stories because there's there's multiple origin stories um, that Irving pulled together to create the uh, headless horseman story. So you use that cemetery scene like even the horseman has limitations. Yes. Yeah, because like the that's bridge tonight. Yeah, yeah, the bridge was supposed to be um, his cutoff. It was supposed to, that the bridge was supposed to be the cutoff point that he couldn't pass. But then, as we see in this uh, um, Tim Burton version, um, the only thing he's you know not privy to is the church hollow ground. Yep, hollow ground. Yeah, so emphasizing really mainly on the whole point, like good and evil. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, but like, I just got the best present every year. Yeah. So, wait, wait. So you don't you don't agree with that assessment between the good and evil part, or um, in in this movie, is there a good and evil? I mean, because literally everyone in this movie crosses a line. Uh, wow. Even our even our hero John uh, Johnny Depp Ichabod uses the little boy, uh, young young master Nesbit as a shield when he goes into the cave to meet the twin. He uses him as a shield with his gun over his shoulder. And I mean, I, I, and and I'm not trying to take away from his heroism in other parts of the movie, but there that right there just. You know, it just I, I, everyone crossed the line. Everyone crossed the line in this movie. So, were there any good people? Were there any bad people? Is there such thing as good and evil, especially in this movie? The oh. only person that I saw that kind of stayed virtuous 
true to themselves was a child, which was young Master Nesbitt. And because in, 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 in his defense and kind of giving me the advantage is that he's still young and he hasn't grown up yet and he hasn't learned to lie and be an adult. But um, he, to me, young Nesbitt is probably the only, you know, the kids, the, the couple of kids that you see in this movie are the only ones that really didn't cross, a, cross any lines. I don't know. I beg okay. to differ. <laughs> so good and good and evil. I don't I don't know about that good and evil when it comes to this movie because that could be it, that could be interpreted differently. Well, I mean, think about it. Okay, so he's Johnny Depp or Ichabod. Ichabod is naive. Doesn't really want to be there. He's pretending, you know, to be this great. You know, I got this. And so when he gets there, you know, when he sees the the corpse, he's all, okay. Everything he's saying, he's trying to maintain and keep stuff down. He's just making up questions, saying stuff. Because <laughs> this is, yeah, but, yeah. You right. never move the body. Right. <laughs> because. But because. You, you can sense the yeah. naivete. Like, he's just, he's, it's just, it's the whole unknown, the whole, um, like when you're first, like when you're young and you first go out in the world and nobody taught you anything and you have to figure everything out on your own. I mean, that's what I got from his character, right? Mm -hmm. And then because he's so afraid and doesn't know how to react and he's just like, he's going to hide behind the first thing he can hide behind, not necessarily saying, I'm putting you in front of me on purpose. Because yeah. we know throughout the whole movie, he, he's just scared. He goes through these moments like, aha, it's like manic. He has like manic depression. So he's like, I have these moments where I don't even know what to do. I, mean, I can't control myself. And then it's, I have the answer. I am the hero. I mean, you know, and it's like, I need you to calm down. But I feel like <laughs> he is, he's the good. And like Christina Ricci was kind of like, you know, Sweden, you know, just I'm eyeing you. I'm eyeing you. I'm keeping an eye on everybody. <laughs> she wanted to be really close, you know, keep your friends closer, your enemies closer. I don't know how it goes. I, I messed that up. But anyway, so, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. And then little Nesbeth, he's like the, the conscious, you know, he's he's like Jimmy Cricket. Yes. Big Bob. And yeah. I feel like that's why, yeah, he's he's the hero. Even though sometimes heroes, you got to do what you got to do sometimes, you know, sometimes and we all do. That doesn't make us evil. It's not like he was doing it on a constant basis. He just had to, you know, protect himself, but he didn't do it. It was fight or flight, you know, fight or flight. <laughs> so I will, I will, I will jump in on this. So this is, uh, so, okay. So the reason why I didn't like uh, Katrina um, is because I didn't like the I don't like the actress. That's one thing. So that that's I will. But eliminating that bias, okay? Because I already don't like Christina Ricci as an actress. But if I take that out and look at the character Katrina, this is what I saw. Uh, and I didn't want I don't I didn't want to get religious with it because this movie kind of it does dabble there, obviously with the church and the the hollow ground and stuff like that. But at the same time, my thought was is that you have this town. That's experiencing this issue. And there, Christina's character, Katrina, her, her approach to it was of faith. Now, granted, it was kind of done from a uh, spiritual kind of like, you could perceive it as evil, right? I guess. Uh, way to handle it with the, which when she was drawing out those figures and stuff like that underneath uh, Ichabob's bed for protection, she was like kind of casting spells, uh, witchcraft, if you will. So, but her approach was of faith, of, of a religious approach to protect her family, right? Yeah. Ichabob comes in with what would be called considered the secular point of view, which is trying to use worldly logic to try to solve a case. And then when he's exposed to the supernatural, he's like, whoa, wait a minute. The, I can't believe that this could actually happen, right? I'm a man of science, and all my gadgets are going to tell me how to solve this. But in the end, it doesn't. He realizes that there's a bit of supernatural you know, faith that he has to have. He has to believe in something beyond his science. And yeah. then the town is just full of sinners. 
you know, that those who did not repent lost their heads, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at good and evil, I'm looking at it, oddly enough, which I hate to admit, but Katrina was probably the symbol of good in this movie because throughout the movie, she didn't do anything that was evil. Um, her character was to protect her family, you know, um, and I mean, she did, I mean, she was smitten with uh, Ichabob, even though she was, uh, you know, um, wasn't she with, uh, what's his name? Who's the guy? Who was her, uh, who was her Casper man? Casper Van Deem? Yeah. Brom <laughs> Von Brunt? Yeah. Yeah. That was her man, right? But I don't think they were married, right? No, they weren't married. No. Yeah. So, he was, so, I mean, he was just courting her. He was courting her, right? So, so she was open game. So there's no, right? So I don't know. And she destroys evidence, which someone might say, oh, that's, that's bad. That's evil. But, <laughs> but, but is it? Like, I mean, I'm not trying to pass judgment on her, but on the grand schemes of things, obviously Ichabod was following logic, which would accuse an innocent man. Right. And when you're going, when you're pursuing truth, you're pursuing righteousness, you're pursuing good. I mean, yes, it could be a point of view, but at the same time, I mean, like I said, I hate to admit that Katrina embodies the good aspect of this movie. Ichabod is more of the neutral party, I guess. I would say Ichabod. (laughs) No, because you got to understand, like Ichabod, like he's, uh, he's, I don't know, he, he does stand for justice and due process, but. He's trying to be he's trying to be impartial. He's trying not to have stakes in either side. He just wants to find the truth. So I don't know if it's necessarily good or evil on the side of Ichabob. I think he's just trying to find the truth. So I isn't that what that, good does? Trying you know, to find the truth? Well, I think in that in that moment that you're that you're speaking of between um Ichabod and Katrina, with her burning the evidence, if he's going after the dad who you know, was innocent of those charges, not innocent, period. Like his hands weren't clean in this. Mm -hmm. Um, So he, he does represent blind justice. Blind justice. Yes. Yeah. He does represent blind justice, which is something that we see, you know, that can translate from this movie into society and into, into the real world. Um, And that is a form of, that is a form of good. I, I will give you that blind justice is a righteous approach to good right i mean without getting too religious in it you know what i mean like just looking at justice for what it is if someone is if someone is uh judged to be executed and the justice you know right kind of the whole eye for an eye deal so if you murder someone you should be killed for that murder yeah you know you're justice right true justice would be if you kill someone then you should be killed because of that action right that if if we're looking at blind justice right it's not it's not taking uh but at the same time had ichabod followed that that what did i say before the uh his chain of reasoning yeah his chain of reasoning uh his chain of reasoning would have committed would have you know condemned a innocent condemned man. an innocent man so yeah. yeah but also the lighting plug comes to play too and it always goes back to me for that for this the, the the sister in the cave and her like what you do in the dark is going to come to the light mm. i and I, I think that um you know that that right there is one of the um uh, speaking points from Irving's uh, original writings on, you know, the the headless horseman was that the horseman was restless and that he couldn't sleep. He he had to return from the grave. He kept, you know, looking for his head, and it was an interpretation of us, you know, not being able to rest in our in our daily lives because of our past because of things that we've done in our past um so the the headless horseman is kind of looked at as an interpretation of you know the things that we do haunt us 
and where every day we get up and we're constantly in pursuit of putting on a new face. I, so, I mean, the, the movie interprets in so many, the characters, let me put it like this, that the, the characters, the way Tim Burton uh, moves these characters around, they're, they speak in just so many different aspects. You know, all of them speak in so many different aspects. So younger generation hanging in the background. Yeah, um, we need you to move to the front of the bus and weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in and chime in anytime, guys. Nikila, we haven't heard from you yet. From yet. Mm. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was doing something. Um, I say overall, I like the movie. Um, it's definitely different type of genre for me to watch because I'm not really a horror or like a thriller kind of person. But um I think it was a good movie. It definitely um kept my attention and I enjoyed watching it. <laughs> um Did you get anything out of it? Did you just was there anything on there that like how to say uh did the scenes what part of what what draw you in? What drew you in? What got you caught up in the movie at what moment? Um, I would definitely say the, the first killing was like, whoa, okay. Um oh, from the very beginning, Ben Carey yes. looking at his uh his driver. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's what basically really drew me in because um you know, you don't always see like somebody getting their head cut off. <laughs> so, yeah. What about mm. you, Jay? Um, for me, what really drew me in, because like I said, at first I was like, mm, is this really my style of movie? Um, and I couldn't really get into it. But um, what drew me in was Brom, um, when he fought the heavy horseman. And every time he went to walk away, I'm just like, stop fighting. You're going to yeah. die. And then he ends up dying on the bridge. And I'm like, well, you kind of had it coming. <laughs> he tried to walk away from you three mm -hmm. times. Yeah. He kind of had it coming. Uh, you know, I, I think that speaks for Brahm's character was that, you know, he was a bully. Um, yeah. You know, the same yeah. thing with, with Ichabod when he pulled the trick of, you know, pretending to be the headless horseman. It was it was his ego. He he couldn't walk. He he couldn't let the headless horseman walk away from him. You yeah, know, it was his ego that got in the way. Yeah, yeah. He wanted I wanted to save the day for Katrina. You know, I don't even think it was for Katrina. I think it was for his own ego that somebody would yeah. turn their back on him and not give him the time of day. That they, they they would look at basically the headless horseman looks down on him. By turning his back on him, like you're you're not worth it. Mm -hmm. And that's I think that upset Brom the most. And that's what drove him the most was he couldn't let it go. He had to be the hero. He couldn't let Ichabod yeah. be the hero. He couldn't yeah. you know let anybody else be the hero. And the fact that the uh, headless horseman wouldn't even give him the time of day, I think that's what his his pursuit was. His pursuit was his own ego and his death. Is, was his own ego, not the not the horseman. So I got a question for everybody. Um, the scene where he came into—I don't remember, remember whose house it was—but he came into the house, he killed the mother, and the little boy underneath the stairs sees her eyes when he's walking out the door with her head, and he pauses for a moment, just a moment longer than he should have do you think maybe at one point he was like i'm getting tired of this do i really need to kill this boy oh, well you know i can't you know i got something I'm, I'm i'm reaching for so i i gotta do it do you think at any point he doesn't want to do these things that he gets tired of it hmm. that's, that's an interesting question um what do you think there yeah because she, she's smiling 
Right. It's really hard. <laughs> Nikila's, uh, yeah, she's got the look on her face like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so let's, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Mm, yeah. I don't. To me, I say no. Um, I don't think he gets tired. Mm. Does it? Like, why? <laughs> Yeah. Because like um and the words keep coming. Right now. Um that's all right, that's all right. Yeah. I'm just teasing. <laughs> I say no um, because um, I feel like because he kept doing it. So it's like, I don't know. I feel like you would say like after so many times, somebody would get tired. But I feel like that's kind of like how other like movies are. Like they just keep doing it. So it's kind of like, that's kind of them. Okay. Taking that perspective, think about people who train dogs for fighting. Right. These dogs don't want to do this, but they're their master. So they have to keep doing what their master says. At some point, don't you think if you are somebody who's being controlled, you're going to like I you have a breaking point. Yeah, but I mean, some just keep doing it. So it's kind of like. Yeah, that's that's what I that's what I got from from that scene. Um, I didn't see Chris, Christopher Walken um not have a okay let's get this over with moment to to me the to me the horseman um kind of had that moment like there you are you know like oh they're there you're hiding you're hiding or there's there's one more that needs to be taken care of uh, to him like, from the very beginning um he's a mercenary who loves the kill so it it's in his character to to be that so i i never i never once got the interpretation from any any of his body language that he just wanted this to be over with yeah i i just felt like he enjoyed it way too much but at this particular time he was tasked you know hmm I mean, it's a question, right? It's a mm -hmm. question. Yeah. And you got to sit there. You're like, okay, because all he really wants is his head. And he's like, I got to keep doing this until, like, does she, is she going to die? Like, like, can I get my head back? But I really think that even, think about, like, serial killers. Serial killers do stuff to the point where they're like, it took them so long to catch me. It was giving you so many clues. Like, they want to be stopped, you know? They they have this urge to do these things, but still somewhere in them they want to stop. Now, granted, we know how he was prior to his death. <laughs> we know. With yeah. his little <laughs> shark teeth and everything. <laughs> he had a horrible dental plan, that's for sure. Right, right. <laughs> he was like, I don't know. <laughs> but um tearing to some meat probably, but um <laughs> but um yeah, after being trapped for so long and then who knows where he goes in that tree who knows if like does he get immobilized does he go somewhere else is he repeating the same day over and over you know what's going on with him in that tree and then he comes up and he's just like furiously on the fastest speed i've ever seen in my life <laughs> trying desperately to find his head you know, I'm like, I think at some point he's just like, I just want my head. And and then I honestly, because I think the way that he walked out the door was very purposeful. Like he had hmm. completed his task. He had the head. He was walking out straight to the door. It wasn't like he was looking around, but then he kind of paused. Right. And I didn't hear the kids say anything. I got it. <laughs> Don't uh, rebuttal. What's up? <laughs> two, two things. Um <laughs> I'm gonna pull. <laughs> you gonna pull the plug on me? Okay. <laughs> Don't put baby in the corner. <laughs> um, the man's t 
tongue hasn't come through customs. That's Apollo Creed. <laughs> that's, that's Apollo Creed. <laughs> Which Rocky? Um, uh, five, and he's talking about Dolph Lundgren's character, uh, Drago, Ivan Drago. Four, is it? Rocky Four. Okay. Um, um, during the press conference. During the press conference. Yes, yes, yeah. The man's tongue hasn't come through customs. <laughs> and he, he does it in such a, an Apollo Creed type of way. Uh, I, I don't know why that just popped into my head, but you, you were, when when you're talking about you know the his his stance and the way he was how he walked out of that out of that room with a purpose, and then it, that Drago thing you know dawned on me. Um, but I, I, I want to say he had a, he had a very con from Star Trek Two, you know, con, a very driven purpose. And when he walked, when he walks out of the house, and he just he bags the head and he gets on, you know, gets on the horse. There was just purpose. Like I, I didn't see, you know, oh my God, here we go again. I get it. Oh. What time is it? I can't believe I got to take another head. I I didn't really get the feeling from his yeah. from his demeanor that this was something that he didn't want to do. It was to him. It was a task. You know, he he tasked me. He tasked me, and I shall have him. I knew him. it was coming. I knew yeah. at some point it was coming out. I knew. Yeah. When you said task, I mean that's what it. That's what this was. It was. It was a task. It was a, a, a duty that he had to perform. It was something that was driving him to get his head. But it, I want to say it was on a, on a supernatural level and not on a conscious level. Um, it was. Yeah. It was. You know, it was because the the incantation was driving him, not not because he just wanted to go back to sleep. You know, oh, I, I have to get my head back. I, I think when she does the incantation it kind of takes away from him having his own will and the head the, the headless horseman is kind of forced into this agreement that he you know didn't want any didn't part of he, yeah he didn't ask for it he didn't want to be a part of it he just wanted you know as far as he's concerned he's dead you know so to to be forced in this incantation to take heads, um, his body language never gave me that. You know, when he passes, when he passes the mom, um, the stepmother—I can't remember her name—Lady uh, Van Tassel. When he passes Lady Van Tassel and goes into the windmill, chasing after you know our our three uh, protagonists at the end there, um, he didn't he didn't stop for a second. He didn't look to her. His body language never even addressed her. So it never was like, you know, I do this and you give me my head back. It was yeah. it was this drive that said, you know, again, where I, I saw that that same drive with um with Brahm was that this is insignificant. I just need to do what I'm I'm here to do. Get on my horse, yeah. take these heads back with me, and you're in my way. You know, um, because yeah, I, yeah. going after going after uh, uh, Crane and and Brom on the bridge, you know, crossing over the top of the bridge, coming up behind them, it was all right. I gave you chances, and now I got to take it to the next level. You know, so to me, it was never. I'm tired of this. I just want my head back because then that reaction would have been completely different. Instead, he took it to the level of, you know, now I you know, I gave you multiple chances, you ticked me off, and now I got to show you what type of person I am. Cross the top of the bridge, come up from behind, and you know, and cuts him in half, like, and walks away. So yeah, to me, I don't think I, that was I, a moment of consciousness either. But I was like, also, <laughs> I think he got he got his prize when he got his prize. Right when he got his head back and he scoops Lady up and he's like, "Now I'm gonna control you," and he's like, "I don't have to come up here anymore." <laughs> That's where I want to say the headless horseman gets his consciousness back. 
Yeah. When what? At the end when he scoops up Lady Von Tassel. Yes. He he yeah. consciously made that choice. Yeah. Yes. That that's actually what I was gonna mention was that I don't think the headless horseman had a choice in any of it until he yeah. got his head back. And then at that point he's like, Well, if I'm going back in, I'm taking <laughs> it. Yeah. Well, do you think that he remembered her when he saw her in that moment? Do you think he remembered her being that little girl that blew him in, that snapped the twig? I'm pretty sure he probably did. Because I, I wondered that myself. I was looking, I was like, is he just taking her because he wants to get his freak on wherever he's going? Or does he remember her as the one that got him killed? Well, I, I'm like, either or. Because if you think about it, he knew directly who to go to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was like, I mean, it wasn't any, meeny, miny, moe. It was like, mm -hmm. come here, you know? So I think he knew. I think yeah. He knew. Yeah. I'm going to say that was personal. I'm going to have to go with personal on that one. What do you guys think? Kids. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Yeah, I agree. That's it? All right. You guys and so... <laughs> uh, I concur. Um, I concur. Okay. You guys I concur. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I want to backtrack just a little bit, um, just to what Uncle Vito said earlier about um, the townspeople, how nobody was truly innocent and if they're truly a good and evil. And I was like, that can really translate to real life. Because if you think about it, everybody in our current society, everybody, nobody's truly innocent. There's no true purity. Everybody has crossed the line. Everybody's done something. Especially with you know Christianity, a lot of things are a sin, and people like to pick and choose one thing to sin, one thing not a sin. What they go by, nobody's innocent. Everybody's done something. Um, nobody's truly pure. So I feel like um, when Uncle Peter, when you said that, that could really translate to real life. Um, yeah. 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 Oh yeah. I I one hundred percent feel like everything that Tim Burton did in this movie was translatable you know maybe not the time period you know the time piece wasn't something that we could relate to nowadays but everything that's happening throughout this movie is something that we can um transition into real world you know where uh, katrina's character like junior was saying um you know katrina's character was probably the only representation of good throughout this movie you know, that that form of spirituality was deemed witchcraft, you know, in the late 1700s, early 1800s um, in Europe before it transitioned into uh, Northern America with the um, um, the Dutch and the, uh, the colonists, if I don't know if you want to call it colonists or co colonizers of uh, uh, Northeast America. In the, the first 13 colonies. Puritans? Um, the Puritans. There you go. Couldn't think yeah. of it. Yeah. So um, a lot in the Headless Horseman, believe it or not, the Headless Horseman story does come from Eastern Europe. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It followed. It just followed the Dutch over uh, to America. Yeah. Um, Jay, um, Jay's point with uh, with all of it, it made me remember Romans 3.23. I didn't want to bring in any uh, Bible verses, but that's immediately. Hey, it is. Me. It is. As soon as Jay said that, I was like, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yeah, that's that's so true. No, it and we're is. All, I, someone told me this one time, a security, uh, one of the, my former coworkers who's a security manager told me this. He goes, um, cause we were just talking shop and, you know, I, I didn't work in security, but he was kind of, you know, I was a manager who had to sign off whenever they made an apprehension. And, uh, one of the things he told me, he says, junior, no matter how good, I'll never forget this too. No matter how good a person may be, if the circumstances are right, we are all potential criminals. And I said, Oh, okay. And I'm looking at him like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, Maybe you, not me. You know? <laughs> and then I'm like, what are you talking about? But then 
it resonated with me in that, you know, if you're in a circumstance where you really need, I don't know, money, food, clothing, whatever, right? You and you're desperate you enough. Yeah. And the circumstances present themselves and nobody's looking. If everything <laughs> lines up, yeah, people will, just as Jay pointed out, we are all capable of sinning. We're all capable of doing something bad and making horrible choices, you know, and that's it. It's, right, it's yeah. like what I when I was arguing with uh, <clears throat> Kia <laughs> about uh, <laughs> the innocence of Mr. Uh, Ichabod Crane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that guy is I'm not like, innocent yeah. in this movie. <laughs> I was like, it was like, it was like, what was it? Yeah, he's kind of like, what was it? Uh, what was that movie? Uh, was it of Mice and Men? No, I don't know. Like Lenny and and yeah, of Mice and Men. Okay. Yeah. Lenny and yeah. George. Yes. Lenny and George. Great Lenny, book. Um, yeah, because Lenny was like, you know, he, he didn't intentionally kill those bunnies. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm like, I don't know where the bunnies came from, but I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. now that, that, that speaks for a, you know, a different discussion and a different video chat all together. You know, we get into um consciousness and morality yeah you know what this I mean? movie was hard to stray from that though i oh yeah it was this, it was this, this movie takes you in so many directions and i like i said i've i've watched it more than six times this week and every time i watched it i tried to watch it from a different perspective you know i watched it you know thinking politically you know all the all the political moves when you look at um you know, from the, what was it, the, you know, the doctor, the burgomaster, the, the magistrate, you know, everyone who had something to gain from all of these maneuvers and positions, you marry my daughter, and I get this piece of land, you know, you look mm -hmm. at it from, you know, the political aspect, you look at it from a religious aspect, you know, looking at it from, you know, a, a horror movie, you know, aspect, and, and, you know, the, the victims and, and you know, and no matter what, no matter how many times I watched it, and you know, to me, the headless horseman was never the bad guy. You know, it just no, turns it out that he never was the never the bad guy in this movie. You know, you know, um, he he immediately he immediately just becomes um, on Magneto. Oh, he immediately oh. becomes Magneto to me in this movie, and a representation of Magneto because. Um, he's forced to do what he has to do. Yeah. He is forced to do what he has to do. Like he's not it's like there's a there's a purpose. Yeah, he's driven by a purpose, and this isn't his choice. He does it because he has to. You know. So, uh, yeah, this movie. Wow. Just One other wow. question: Did anybody <laughs> think when he put on those spectacles? Was that from? Edward Scissorhands, was it using Edward Scissorhands by the doctor? I can or... see that correlation. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it was when he was like fixing his hands or his face or something. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Well, it's, it's, it's a tie into Tim Burton for sure. You know? Oh, yeah. Uh, of course. We were laughing, my, um, because we're, uh, we're watching, uh, Edward Scissorhands and, immediately we recognize Danny Elfman's uh, music because we're like, it all sounds the same. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, we're like, they're like, uh, just like, is this the same guy? Uh, Cause uh, my daughter was like, is this the same guy who wrote uh, for, I forgot what movie she was referencing. Oh, uh, I think it was Beetlejuice. And I was like, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, the, same, it's the same guy. He's like, it's, it's his sound. You know? <laughs> yeah. He works well with uh, Tim Burton movies. And that's, it's even the same yeah, for this. Corpse Bride. So I was like, know? yeah. Yes. Yes. That's next on my list, Corpse Bride. So yeah, I think I think Tim Burton has a. Uh, um, I know we're running short on time. Uh, Tim Burton well, keeps a tight crew. Yeah, we're, we're on an intermission. We're gonna go on uh, what a ten minute intermission and jump back on take two. Yeah, we could do that. Like plans, can we come back man. at ten thirty. Uh, ten thirty. Oh, eleven thirty. Yeah. 1030 for you, 1030 yeah. for us. Okay. I'm like, 1030? What are you talking about, man? All right. Okay, yeah. cool. So, uh, 15 there minutes. There we go. 15 minutes. All right. All, All right. right. See so you guys we... in bed. Bye. Bye.